Okay, so where we ended off um, during our last lecture was looking at this problem. And I said we were going to take a peek at it today. So it's pop-up question 12.6. It says the vapor pressure of liquid chloroform um, is 400 torr at 24.1 degrees Celsius and 100 torr at negative 6.3 degrees Celsius. What's the delta H of vaporization for chloroform? And so that's what we're looking for. And in order to do this problem, we're going to need the clausius clapeyron equation. And I will provide this to you for your third exam. So it's the ln of P2 divided by P1 is equal to delta H of vaporization over R multiplied by 1 over T1, subtract 1 over T2, like that. So what we'll do here is we'll write down our P1 as being equal to 400, 400 torr. I've already gone ahead and calculated T1 in Kelvin, and T1 in Kelvin is um, 297.1 Kelvin. So we get that down to 97.1 Kelvin. Our P2, P100 torr, so that's good. And our T2, negative 6.3, add 273.15 to that. What do you get? I got 266.7 Kelvin, something like that. So we'll plug that into 66.7 Kelvin. And there we go. Now we have everything set up. Let's plug these numbers here into our clausius clapeyron equation. So we have the ln of 100 divided by 400. I'm going to leave the units out here because they cancel. Is equal to delta H of vaporization divided by R, keep in mind that our R value is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, not kilojoules, joules. We divide that, so 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin, like that, and then one over 297.1, um, subtract one over 266.7 Kelvin, like that. When you work all this out, you get negative 1.39 divided by negative 3.82 times 10 to the negative 4 reciprocal Kelvin is equal to delta H of vaporization, vaporization divided by 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. You cross multiply. And you end up with your delta H of vaporization being 3.02, <clears throat> excuse me, times 10 to the fourth power joules per mole. We want to convert that into kilojoules, and we know that in one kilojoule there are a thousand joules. So we divide by a thousand, and we get that our delta H of vaporization is equal to 30. Um, 30 kilojoules per mole. I should only have two sig figs, and there's only two sig figs in the answers anyway. So there we go. We solved the problem using the clausius clapeyron equation. Again, I will provide this equation for you on exam three, so you won't have to memorize that equation. Okay, well, let's switch gears for a second and talk about vaporization. And more particularly, let's talk about evaporation. So if we have a sample, of a liquid, okay? We have a collection of molecules in there and they're gonna have a distribution of kinetic energies. And we looked at the Boltzmann distribution during the last lecture and we looked at it earlier on in this class. And so we see that we have some molecules that are moving slowly, some that have the average you know, kinetic energy, so the average speed, and then we have some that are moving faster. Now the faster particles, they're gonna be more likely to overcome the attractive forces from their neighbors. Let's think about that for a second. If I have a bunch of particles, right, we know that there's an intermo there's intermolecular forces, right, that I'm just highlighting in yellow. There's some kind of intermolecular forces, which is kind of like the glue or the cohesive forces that hold those molecules together. Well, if a molecule is only moving with a little bit of speed, you know, it's, it's going to be held you know, more tightly than if I have a molecule that's got a bunch of speed, right, then it's going to have more um, uh, a, a more of an ability to separate or to overcome the attractive forces from its neighboring atoms or molecules. So the molecules that are at the surface of a liquid are held only are only held in place by the attractive forces from the molecules or atoms from below. 
let's think about that for a second. And there's a really good figure that shows this in the textbook. I didn't put it in my slides. But if you think about, you know, you have a liquid, okay? If you have a lot of molecules in this liquid, okay? Now this is just artist's, artist's rendition here. Is that what you call it, right? So this is Mr. Dion's best drawing of a bunch of particles or a bunch of molecules, okay, in a sample here. Well, if you have a molecule, you know, in, in the middle, okay, let's say you have this molecule right here. Where is that molecule being pulled on? Well, it's surrounded by molecules that are identical to it. So it's going to be pulled literally in all directions. It's being pulled to the sides. It's being pulled up. It's being pulled down. It's being pulled backward. Forward. It's literally being pulled in an infinite number of directions. Whereas if I have a surface molecule, okay, what about a molecule at the surface, right? A surface molecule. If I have a molecule at the surface, it's not going to be being pulled up at all. Right? It's only going to be being pulled to the sides and being pulled down. Okay, There's going to be no force pulling it upwards. And so since there's less attractive forces acting on molecules at the surface, it's actually easier for the surface molecules to escape from the liquid. There's simply less intermolecular forces acting on those molecules because they're right at the surface. And when we have an open container, we discussed this last class, that a dynamic equilibrium is not going to be reached. In fact, a student asked me a really good question about that. He said, well, if molecules are evaporating at a certain rate, shouldn't molecules be condensing at a certain rate? And I said, well, if you have an open container, that's not going to be true, right? Because you can see that the molecules, you can see they're trying to get out of here, right? They're going to, if they're going to be converted into, into a gas, the gas is going to go anywhere in the room because gases will seek up to fill up the volume of whatever container they're in, whether it's a room or whatever, okay? So if two molecules or say a molecule of gas is going to condense into the liquid phase, the chance that it's going to condense right over top of here and go back into the liquid is very small. And so a dynamic equilibrium will not be reached unless you have a sealed container where all the particles of gas, when they do condense, they're going to condense right back into that same container. And we looked at that during the last lecture. Let's talk about boiling instead of evaporation. Well, boiling, the boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a liquid is equal to atmospheric pressure. Okay, so let's think about atmospheric pressure for a second. Well, if I'm at one atmosphere, so if I'm at sea level, say for example, Miami Beach is the example put in here, okay, what's the boiling point of water in Miami Beach? It's going to be 100 degrees Celsius, right? That's gen generally what we think of when we think of the boiling point of water. Well, it says here the definition of boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So what does that tell us? That tells us is if the atmospheric changes, atmospheric pressure changes rather, our boiling point is going to change, isn't it? If you go up to the top of Mount Everest, the atmospheric pressure at Mount Everest is only around a third of what the atmospheric pressure is at sea level. And so the boiling point of water is much less at Mount Everest, okay? And you see those on this plot here. This is pressure listed in kilopascals, but that's not important. All that's important is that you see that the water on Mount Everest, so if we think of the, the red arrow here, has a much lower boiling point 71 degrees Celsius. I'll try my best to draw a line. So it's something around 71 degrees Celsius compared to water at Miami Beach, okay, which has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. This is Miami Beach, and the red one is Mount Everest. Now, if you think about this, you know, does this make sense in terms of atmospheric pressure? Okay, well, if I think about, you know, having a pot of water, maybe if I just move this slide back a little bit, okay. You have to follow me on this demo here. If I have the planet Earth, okay, this is Earth, okay, and this is the beach on Earth, okay, that's sea level. If I try to boil some water, maybe I'll put the sea level over. If I have sea level here, and I try to boil some water in a pot at sea level, right, I'm trying to get water molecules in the liquid phase to escape and go into the gassy phase. So that means I'm going to have to impart some energy to those molecules in the liquid phase. Now, what's preventing them 
from staying in the container. Well, obviously the intermolecular forces between the hydrogen molecules, but there's also a column of air, right? There's also a column of air, and this is not the scale, this is going all the way up to where the atmosphere ceases to exist, right? There's air on top of that pot that's got the same um, area as the top of that pot of water that's pushing those molecules back in, right? Now, each thing, each person who's hearing the sound of my voice right now, there's a column of air acting on top of you, right? There's, a, there's an atmospheric pressure acting on top of your body right now. You don't feel it. You don't notice it because we experience it all the time, but it's there. So again, as these water molecules are trying to escape into the gaseous phase, not only do you have the intermolecular forces, but you have atmospheric pressure pushing down on those molecules. What about if you're at, on Pike's Peak? Okay, so this is not the scale. Okay, this is Pike's Peak on the planet Earth. Okay, that's the top of the mountain. Okay, and let's say you go there with some friends. You're like, we're going to boil some water here. Okay, so this is, you get the same pot. You get the same amount of water. Is there a column of air pushing down on those molecules of water in your pot of water on top of Pike's Peak? Absolutely there is, right? There's totally a column of air pushing down on those molecules. But is the height as big, right? If you compare the height of this column versus the height of this column, the height of the column of air, the atmospheric pressure acting upon those molecules, trying to keep them in the liquid phase on top of Pike's Peak, is a smaller column of air, right? So you have less atmospheric pressure pushing those water molecules back in the pot, so to speak. And so that is why it takes less energy to boil water at a higher atmosphere. Give me a thumbs up if that makes some sense to you. All right, cool, yeah. You know, the first college that I taught at in Canada, they, um, you know, I taught General Chemistry 1 and General Chemistry 2, and I looked at one of their General Chemistry 2 final exams uh, one time that they had written, like one before I was a teacher there, and the, the last question on the exam was based on boiling points of water. Now, I don't remember the entire question from soup to nuts, but it was basically, you know, you were comparing the cooking time the amount of time it took to hard boil an egg at sea level, so at Miami Beach or wherever, compared to how long it took to boil or hard boil an egg rather on top of Mount Everest. And, you know, I solved the problem and it ended up taking, you know, a long time to hard boil an egg. And another thing is if you live in Colorado, you might have noticed if you've ever lived at sea level before, how much longer it takes to cook things when you boil them, right? Because water in Colorado Springs boils in around. 93 degrees Celsius. It's not a huge difference, but it's different enough that it does have an effect if you're trying to cook pasta or something. Anyhow, so that's um, boiling point. And you, need, you, you should really know this definition, that boiling point is the temperature at which vapor, the vapor pressure of a liquid is equal to atmospheric pressure. That's something you should be able to, you know, just kind of give me, should, should, I, should we ask for that on an exam? Now, if we compare the two processes, it's not 100% clear in your mind. Evaporation is what happens only at the surface, okay? Evaporation is a surface phenomenon. You can even see here that an evaporation is only occurring at the top, right? At the surface of the liquid, whereas boiling happens everywhere, right? If you look at the boiling, um, that's a bulk phenomenon. Bulk is another way of saying it happens everywhere, right? You can see the boiling is happening all the way through the liquid, and it's happening at the surface as well. So it's happening everywhere. Evaporation is a relatively slow process. The pressure of your substance is less than atmospheric pressure. And what did we say that boiling is when the pressure of your substance is equal to atmospheric pressure? Boiling occurs at a fixed point called the boiling point, whereas evaporation occurs at all temperatures. And as we increase the temperature, we're going to increase the evaporation rate. Now, this last point that I want to make here is one that, you know, sometimes confuses students. Some students get it, you know, right away. But I want you to think about this last point here. It says, at a constant pressure and temperature, or sorry, at constant pressure, the temperature of a substance doesn't change until the phase change is complete. What does that mean? If you have, let's imagine that this is water here, okay, and it's on your stove and you're just boiling some water. You're taking it and you're converting it from the liquid phase into the gaseous phase. 
Okay, if you're doing that at sea level, the boiling point of water at sea level is 100 degrees Celsius. What this bullet point here is saying is if we're at a constant pressure, so say we're at one atmosphere, okay, boiling point of water is going to be 100 degrees Celsius. The temperature of that water is going to remain at 100 degrees Celsius. You'd be like, well, if I heat it up really hard, maybe it'll get to 102 or 110 degrees Celsius. No, it won't. It won't. It doesn't matter how hard of a blowtorch or whatever kind of flame you put underneath that water, the temperature of that water while it's boiling will always be 100 degrees Celsius. And if you're like, well, what if, come on, what if I add more heat? Then the molecules are going to move faster, then the temperature is going to go up. No, not going to go up. Why? Because all the extra energy that you're putting in there is going to go towards vaporizing the molecules, converting them from a liquid to a gas. The temperature will only go up once everything's been converted to a gas, okay? So again, it's, it's not easy for a student sometimes, but that's the way it works, okay? The temperature of the water is not gonna increase no matter how much um, heat you put under it. If you put a thermometer in the water while it's boiling, it's always gonna read 100 degrees Celsius, no matter how much you've got in there, okay? All right, there we go. And that's a phase change, right? Going from um, a liquid to a gas. So let's talk about phase changes more and if you weren't, you know, if you didn't follow me 100% on that last bullet point, we're going to talk about it even more. So it says here, changes the state, talking about going from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas. And this, um, this slide is going to deal with the conversion of a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a solid. Oops, my highlighter. If we convert a solid to a liquid, I'm sure you're all familiar with the word melting. In chemistry, instead of using the word melt, we use fusion and i know you probably don't think of fusion as being melting but that's how we describe it in chemistry and when we convert a liquid to a solid of course everybody knows that we call that freezing now if we look at our bullet point over here it says fusion molecules are partially over uh, par sorry molecules partially overcome their intermolecular forces and move from the solid to the liquid phase right in a solid the intermolecular forces are so strong that they're holding those molecules together in rigid fixed positions. When we provide enough energy, the molecules are going to start moving faster, right? They're going to have more thermal energy. And once they start moving fast enough, they're going to be able to overcome those intermolecular forces that held them in the solid phase, and they're going to convert to a liquid. Whereas when we freeze something, it says liquid molecules are going to lose kinetic energy. They can't flow, and then they start to become a solid. If we think about the delta H of fusion, right? The change in enthalpy of fusion. So uh, uh, the amount of heat associated with melting something, as you can probably guess, that's going to be, that's always going to be a positive number, right? Because you have to put energy in to melt something, right? You could even write that energy, energy in, in order to melt something. Whereas when we freeze something, right? If we look up the delta H of freezing, okay? That's going to be a negative number, isn't it? Right, because heat is going to be released. Particles are moving quickly in the liquid phase. When they start moving more slowly in the solid phase, where does that energy go? It's going to be released in the form of heat. And so delta H of freezing is negative. Now, since these are reverse processes, I can say that the delta H, and I'm going to have to write it over here, the delta H of fusion or melting is going to be equal to the negative of the delta H of freezing. So if you look up, you know, if you go into a table or in the appendix in your textbook or something, and you're trying to look up the delta H of freezing of um, a compound, it's not going to be in there. You're going to find the delta H of fusion, and then you would just take the negative that, of that, right? Because you know that fusion or melting and freezing are opposite processes. Okay, so that covers, you know, going from a solid to a liquid and a liquid to a solid. What other kind of phase changes do we have? Well, of course, we have going from a solid to a gas and a gas to a solid. Now, going from a solid to a gas, I'm sure that if I had asked everybody in here, you know, what's that? Everybody would say, well, that's sublimation. You know, the classic example would be something like um, dry ice, right? If you've ever seen um, carbon dioxide in the solid phase, okay, that's called dry ice. Dry ice and then sometimes they are back in the olden days i think they used to use dry ice as like a smoke you know provide smoke at a rock concert nowadays we have fog machines which are much better but anyhow 
Um, and then we produce CO2 gas, which is just gaseous carbon dioxide. So solid carbon dioxide is dry ice. It's a solid. If you've ever held dry ice before in your hand, it'll burn you really quickly because it's really cold. Anyhow, but when we have that conversion of a solid to a gas, we call that sublimation. So we say something is subliming. Now, um, something that's is not as commonly used in our everyday parlance as scientists is the conversion of a gas to a solid. That's called deposition. Okay, so basically this is where or when vapor molecules are captured by the solid phase. Now I can't give you a lot of good examples of a def of deposition, um, but um, one thing that I've used several times in my life as an organic chemist is oftentimes we take advantage of deposition to purify solids. So if we have an impure solid, we'll heat it up under a vacuum so it will sublime. And then we basically cause that gas to collect around a piece of glassware with, with none other than dry ice in it. So, so it's really cold and basically the gas will, um, uh, will, will deposit, you know, or deposition will occur on that cold surface and you end up with the pure crystal. Now, uh, you know, that, that's something that we don't really talk about a whole lot in this class, but if you're wondering, you know, about examples. Another example of sublimation would be mothballs. I don't know if anybody here has, you know, um, you're all, you know, most of you are younger than me, I'm sure. So you probably have a collection of, you know, priceless cashmere sweaters or something. So mothballs would be another example of sublimation. If you've ever put mothballs in with your sweaters or winter clothing or something, um, the mothballs, that, that's naphthalene. The solid is called naphthalene. It's an organic molecule. Anyhow, it, um, it doesn't melt. Okay, It goes directly from the solid to the gas state. So a couple of examples there. Anyhow, what am I talking about here? Let's keep going here. Um, yeah, let's talk about vaporization and condensation because we already looked at those in gross and dirty detail earlier on um, today. So vaporization and condensation. But you should know all of these different phase changes, you should be able to, you know, apply all of these words, vaporization, condensation, fusion, freezing, sublimation, deposition. Okay, everybody that's hearing the sound of my voice should know what these words mean. Well, what would happen if we were to take, you know, a solid, I was going to say a solid in the solid phase. So, so, so if we were to take a solid and warm it up, right? Let's say we took a block of ice you know, a really cold block of ice from the, from an Arctic lake up in Canada. You know, it's at minus 30 degrees Celsius. And you keep war and you warm that block of ice up, you know, and you warm it up until it turns into a water vapor. Okay, so you, first you melt the ice, then you boil the water. You know, well, what does it look like? How much heat does it take to do that, to convert a solid into a gas, you know, for it to undergo all those phase changes? Well, in order to determine how much heat is used to do all those phase changes, you would look at what's called a heating curve. Okay, a heating curve. And the heating curve is nothing more than a plot of temperature. Okay, temperature versus time. Okay, so now the amount of time is not important. But what's important here is we want to look at all of these different areas. Okay, because if you look at the curve, you can see there's parts of it where we have a positive slope. There's other parts where it's a flat line, okay? And if you look at where those flat lines are here and here, you notice that they correlate to boiling point and melting point. Okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Well, let's follow the journey of a block of ice as it gets converted into water vapor, okay? So again, let's just imagine we're talking about ice. This goes for any kind of solid being converted to a gas, but let's just imagine we have a block of ice, okay? So we're going to start out down here, all right? And let's say we have our ice. Let's imagine it's at, like I said, minus 30 degrees Celsius. Again, the temperature scale is not important. But if I have ice at minus 30 degrees Celsius, and I have a question for you guys, and it's just a simple answer. If I have ice at minus 30 degrees Celsius, if I heat that ice up, oh boy, I put a, I heat it right up to minus 20 degrees Celsius. What will the phase be if I warm ice from minus 30 to minus 20? Will it be a solid will it have, or will it be a liquid? Will it have melted? But I warmed it up to minus 20. I've, I'm cooking it, baby. Who could answer that for me? Would it be a liquid if I warmed it up to minus 20? Or would it be a solid if I warmed it up to minus 20? Uh, 
I like, yeah, I like the way you describe it, uh, Blake. Blake says, just a hotter solid. He's 100% correct, right? Just because I use the word warm doesn't mean it melted, okay? You know, you can take something that's frozen and warm it up a little bit. It's still frozen, okay? It's not to, until you get to a melting point. The melting point of water is what? For water, the melting point is zero degrees Celsius, zero degrees Celsius for H2O, okay? So if I warm it up, right, Blake? If I warm it up to minus 10 degrees Celsius, it's still a solid. If I, It's not until I get to zero degrees Celsius that it starts to melt. So if I wanted to determine, you know, how much heat was required to get that block of ice from minus 30 all the way up to zero, how would I calculate how much heat that took? Because there was a change in temperature, wasn't there? The way I would calculate that is I would use this equation right here. I'd say that the heat required for heating that solid is equal to the mass of the solid, however much ice I had, multiplied by the heat capacity of that solid. So we'd have to look up the heat capacity of ice times the change in temperature. That's how we would calculate the amount of heat it would took to warm up that block of ice to zero degrees Celsius. Now, what did I tell you a couple slides ago? I said, if you have a liquid and it starts melting, okay, sorry, if you have a, a chunk of ice and it starts melting, when you have that ice undergoing melting, so the solid and liquid are in equilibrium, the temperature of the water is not going to change. If you have a glass of ice water and it's 99% ice and 1% water, if you stick a thermometer in that water, it's going to read zero degrees Celsius. If almost all of that ice has melted, Let's say it's you know one percent ice. There's this tiny little minuscule piece of ice floating, and the rest of it's water. The water is still going to read zero degrees Celsius. Why? Because where is the heat going? The heat is not causing a temperature change whatsoever, right? No delta T occurring here. I didn't see any change in temperature there. Where is the heat going? The heat is all going into the solid, into the ice, and causing it to form a liquid. Okay, or it's causing it to melt. Okay, give me a thumbs up and follow me on that concept. Okay, we already looked at it once today. Here's the second time, but I want to make sure you follow me. That when we have a solid and a liquid in equilibrium, any energy that we put into that ice at the melting point is going to go into melting the ice. It's not going to warm the water. So how would we figure out how much heat did it take to melt all that ice once it got to zero degrees Celsius? We would use this equation right here. We'd say that the Q is equal to the delta H of the phase change, which would be the delta H of fusion here, multiplied by the number of moles. Okay, good enough. If we go to the next step, and I'm gonna move a little bit quicker here. Okay, if we go to the next step, if we take that liquid, as soon as all that ice is melted, it's 100% water, can you warm up a liquid? Can you warm up water? Of course. Can you have water at 10 degrees Celsius? Yes, I don't wanna go swimming in it. Can you have water at you know, 20 degrees Celsius, absolutely. I'd love to go for a swim in that, right? So it's still water, but it's a different temperature, right? So we're going to heat that water up. You can see that there is a change in temperature. How would we calculate the amount of heat associated with that? We take, and we'd say the Q is equal to that mass of that water multiplied by the heat capacity, multiplied by the change in temperature that occurred. Then, once we hit 100 degrees Celsius for our water, okay, and again, I'm just using water as an example, okay, once we reach the boiling point, 100 degrees Celsius, we're going to have liquid and vapor in equilibrium. As I told you, when you have the two phases in equilibrium, there will be no change in temperature. Every bit of energy is going into that, those liquid molecules and vaporizing them, okay? It's not until all of the liquid has been converted to vapor that you can start warming up that vapor. So how would I calculate the amount of heat associated with this phase change? Q multiplied by the delta H of, of course, vaporization in this case, multiplied by N. See what I'm doing here? And then for the last step, what are we doing? We're taking that vapor and we're warming it up. Can you warm up a vapor? Of course. Water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. If you have you know, water molecules at 100 degrees Celsius, they're, they're, that's steam, my friend. Can you have steam that's at 150 degrees Celsius, why not? Can you have steam at 200 degrees Celsius? Why not? How would you calculate the amount of heat required for that phase change? You'd say the Q, not the phase change, sorry, 
the heating of the phase. You say the Q is equal to the mass of the steam multiplied by the heat capacity of steam multiplied by the change in temperature. Okay, so you can see that for the green positive slopes, you would use this equation. Q is equal to mass times um, the heat capacity multiplied by the change in temperature. Whereas for the phase changes, there's no change in temperature. You take, and you say that heat is equal to the delta H of the phase change multiplied by the number of moles. Now there's a couple of, you know, kind of important things we have to think about before we can move on here. Okay, heat capacity, C, that's reported in joules per gram degrees Celsius. Okay, whereas delta H, Delta H is always reported in kilojoules per mole, as we saw earlier today. So you want to be really careful when you're asked to calculate the Q for an entire process, because if you wanted to find the total amount of heat, you'd have to add up the Q1 plus the Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4 plus Q5, okay, so on and so forth. You'd have to tally all those up, so you want to make sure that you're being really careful because joules and kilojoules do not mix. You can't add those together. Okay, so just kind of a disclaimer that all of the energy units are the same before you start tallying, you know, everything up there. Well, so far we know about phase changes, like let's say phase changes of water at zero degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. Well, what happens to a phase change or how is a phase change affected when we change atmospheric pressure right what if we change the pressure from one atmosphere to you know whatever what if we put it in a vacuum what if we increase the pressure a lot well if we want to look at the state of a substance a solid liquid or a gas at a particular temperature or pressure for that we would use what's called a phase diagram OK, a phase diagram summarizes the conditions at which a substance exists as a solid, liquid or gas. So again, we use a phase diagram to determine the state of a substance at a particular temperature and pressure. Now we have two phase diagrams on um, on this page and I'm going to kind of compare them. You can see there's some similarities just by, you know, if you just blinked and look at this very quickly, you can see there's some similarities, but there's some differences as well. Well, first let's look at the axes. On the x-axis we have temperature. So we can see that temperature is increasing going from left to right on both of these. On the y-axis we have pressure. So as we go up like this, pressure is increasing. Now let's focus on, well, let's just look at the phase diagram for carbon dioxide. So let's just look at this whole square. You see there's three colors here. Okay. And you can see that near these three colors, um, we see the words solid, liquid, and gas. Okay, so obviously where we have the blue, that's a solid, where we have green, that's a liquid, and where we have a yellow, um, or where we have yellow, that's a gas. So what does that mean then? That means that these black lines here, okay, these are phase boundaries, aren't they? Okay, and you can even see that being described here. If this yellow line that I have highlighted here, if I have a gas on this side and a solid on that side, that means at this range, right, inside this range of temperatures and pressures, this is where the processes of sublimation and deposition of carbon dioxide would occur, right? Now let's say we had carbon dioxide, and we'll just pick a point that's shown here. If you have carbon dioxide at one atmosphere and minus 78 degrees Celsius, Sorry, if we have uh, carbon dioxide at one atmosphere in a temperature less than 78, minus 78, so if we have it at a temperature less than 78 degrees Celsius, it's going to be a solid. But if we warm it up, what's going to happen is it's going to be converted into a gas, right? It's going to cross that phase boundary and go into the gaseous state. Okay, so that's a phase boundary. Let's look at another phase boundary just for fun here. You see that this line here is the phase boundary between melting and freezing. 
Now it says here that the line has a positive slope, as you can obviously see. And so it says solid is denser than a liquid. Well, what does that mean exactly? Let's say I have, you know, carbon dioxide at this point. Let me get a different colored pen here. Okay. I'm at this temperature and pressure. Okay. So here my carbon dioxide is a liquid. Right. So this is at a certain temperature. It doesn't matter. It's above minus 70 and it's below 31 degrees Celsius. And it's at a pressure that's higher than atmospheric pressure. But what happens when we crank up the pressure? If we increase the pressure, watch, we're going to go da, 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 and then all of a sudden we're going to cross into the solid phase. Does that make sense? That we'd be going from carbon dioxide in the liquid phase to carbon dioxide in the solid phase? Well, it kind of makes sense to me because I know that when I have molecules in the solid phase, they're going to be closer together, aren't they? So, well, come on, that stands to reason that if I'm putting pressure on the molecules of carbon dioxide in the liquid phase, they're going to get packed tighter and tighter and tighter, and they're going to be more dense, and it's going to be converted into a solid as I increase the pressure. Okay, so that's why our line has a positive slope, because as I increase the pressure on a liquid, it's going to be converted into a solid. What are some other points that are interesting here? Well, if we look at this barrier here, this is where phase changes between a gas and a liquid occur. So this is the phase boundary of liquid and gas. Okay. Um, some other things that are really important to know here on this phase diagram, you probably notice there's a couple other things here. The first thing is the triple point. So the triple point is the point at which a solid, liquid, and gas all exist together. Now you're thinking like, wow, that's crazy. How could I have solid, liquid, and gas all existing at the same time? Well, keep in mind, that's going to be at a very specific temperature, negative 57 degrees Celsius, and a very specific pressure. So that's a lot of pressure, right? 5.5 times atmospheric pressure. Okay, so that's a specific point, okay, the triple point. But you notice there's also something else here called the critical point. And the critical point is really cool, actually. Well, I don't mean it in terms of temperature. I just mean it's really interesting. Because you notice that at the critical point, all of a sudden the phase boundary stops. It's like, huh? Where's my phase boundary? There's no phase boundary. Well, there's a good reason for that. Okay, where's my, um, where's my pencil? There we go. There's a good reason why there's no phase boundary there. It's because if you have carbon dioxide, let's say at 31 degrees, and um, uh, let's say below 31 degrees. Let's say we have carbon dioxide at 30 degrees and it's at 73 um, atmospheres. It's going to be in the liquid phase. Okay. And if you were to reduce the pressure on it, it would be converted into a gas. But once you get above the critical point, okay, this is where neither liquid nor gas exist. Okay. It's actually kind of a hybrid of the two phases. And if you're like, what? Yeah, so up here, past the critical point, okay, past this temperature and pressure, you end up with something that's called a supercritical fluid. Okay, so it's not a solid, or sorry, it's not a gas and it's not a liquid, it's a supercritical fluid. Now, I'm not an expert in supercritical fluids, but I've had them used for me before when I worked in industry. I used to um, do purification of compounds and sometimes we would produce compounds that were non-superimposable mirror images of each other. And so these compounds were very difficult to purify using traditional methods. And the way that they would be purified is by using carbon dioxide as a supercritical fluid. Anyhow, it's beyond the scope of our course, but that's one example that I can give you of when you might use a supercritical fluid. Now, if you look at the phase diagram for water, you know, you see a lot of similarities between it and the phase diagram for carbon dioxide, don't you? Look, I see solid liquid gas. I see all the phase boundaries. I see the triple point. The triple point for water is really interesting, right? When we have liquid, um, solid liquid and gas, water all existing together at the same point, at the same time, the temperature is pretty darn close to zero degrees Celsius, isn't it? It's almost exactly zero degrees Celsius. But if you look at the pressure, whoa, that's a really low pressure, right? That's almost a vacuum, 0 0.006 atmosphere. Again, the critical point is shown up here. Okay, so once we pass 374 degrees Celsius and 218 
atmospheres. Then we get into the critical point of water where it becomes a super critical fluid. But if you ask me, the most interesting thing on the um, on the uh, phase diagram of water is this line right here, right? And you knew I was going there, right? Because this line has a negative slope, doesn't it? Much different, right? Than carbon dioxide, which had a positive slope. Look, it says this line has a negative slope. Liquid is denser than solid. Well, everybody knows that. You guys know that water in the liquid phase is more dense than water in the solid phase, right? Everybody in this who's hearing the sound of my voice just put ice cubes in a glass before. Where do the ice cubes go? Do they sink to the bottom? No, they float on the top. So if you think about it, you know, we take that we take this for granted all the time that ice floats on top of water, but it's not true for most for most compounds. Okay. In fact, most compounds, the solid is going to be more dense than the liquid because the molecules are packed closer together. It's what we just talked about with carbon dioxide, and nobody typed in the chat like, hey, this is a well, slow down. You know, a solid, you know, nobody tried to argue with me because what I said was true. But with water, it's a different situation. Let's watch, okay? Let's say we have some water, or let's say we have some ice, okay? We have ice at one atmosphere, okay? And minus one degree Celsius. Okay, so this is water in the solid phase. We call that ice. Okay, everybody. Knows. What happens if I increase the pressure on that ice? Well, if we were thinking about carbon dioxide, we said, well, come on, if we're packed, if we're pushing, we're putting more and more pressure on the particles and the molecules, should they just get closer together and it becomes, you know, an even harder solid? Well, look what happens here. All of a sudden, when you put more and more pressure on water, oh, it becomes a liquid. Why would it do that? Okay. Well, there's a good reason for that. Okay. And the reason why is because we actually are putting the particles of water closer together when they get in the liquid phase, but that's counterintuitive, isn't it? Okay. So, what you need to understand is that the reason why ice is less dense than water is because ice is. When the molecules of water packed together in the liquid phase, they're actually closer together than when we have ice. Now, you're like, can you explain that a little bit more? I will. Okay, I promise I will. But I'm going to show you um, in two slides from now. Okay, I have a little picture that can show you uh, a little bit more detail about that. But that's those are phase diagrams. Now, phase diagrams, these are the kind of things we could probably sit here and just machinate and talk about it all day. But, you know, I'm kind of giving you the the bird's eye view or the 30,000 foot view of what you need to know about phase diagrams. Let's move on to the next slide. Just a few notes about melting points, some thoughts that I want you to be aware of. It says here, for a pure substance, melting point and freezing point are identical. I went over that with you today because we spoke about the delta H of uh, delta H of fusion, and I said it would be equal to the negative of the delta H of freezing because they're just reverse processes. The effect of pressure on freezing point or, or melting point is actually very, very small. Um, in the organic chemistry lab, something we ask students to do all the time is take melting points, you know, and um, if they want to compare their melting point with the melting point of another compound in a reference book, no problem, because even though in Colorado Springs we're at higher altitude um, than, than most people live, Melting point and freezing points aren't going to be affected by atmospheric pressure. Boiling points are affected by atmospheric pressure. Anyhow, it says here an increase in pressure favors the more dense phase. Notice the more dense phase for carbon dioxide was a solid, but for water it was a liquid. It says here it's usually the solid phase. So an example of that would be CO2, right? CO2 solid is more dense than CO2 liquid, whereas water is an anomaly. Right, water is denser than ice. The slope of the solid liquid line depicts the behavior of the freezing point as pressure is increased or decreased. So when we have a positive slope for melting and freezing on our phase diagram, that means the solid is denser than the liquid. And when we have a negative slope, and this is the case with water, the liquid is denser than the solid. And again, I'm going to explain that right here, why that is. And it's all in this structure right here. Now, let's just read through it here. It says the water is a liquid at room temperature. Okay. Most molecular substances with small molar masses are gases at room temperature. Now, this is something I didn't expect you to, you know, wake up in the middle of the night and think about. But now that you've been around for a while and you've studied quite a bit of chemistry, if you think about it, water is a really small molecule. 
and it's made of oxygen in, the two, in two of the smallest atoms on the periodic table. It has a really low molar mass, 18 grams per mole. If you think about these molecules, these are also small molecules. Methane, CH4, ammonia, NH3, and hydrogen chloride. Those are all gases at room temperature. Water isn't a gas at room temperature. It's a liquid. Now, why would that be? The reason why is because of hydrogen bonding between water molecules. And as I told you during the last lecture, the hydrogen bonding in water is even a special type of hydrogen bonding because it's maximized. I have two hydrogens, and I happen to have two lone pairs. We call the hydrogens H-bond donors, and we call the, um, um, the lone pairs H-bond acceptors. It's not a vernacular that we use in this class, but what you need to understand is that water maximizes everything, right? It's got the exact number of hydrogens as it does lone pairs. So the hydrogen bonding is maximized. And so when we form ice, this is what ice looks like, okay? Now it's not easy to tell, but if we kind of zoom in, oh jeepers, and I have a prescription with the optometrist soon. Uh, like you should see me, I'm like backing away from my slide here to try to read it. Let me pick, um, I'll pick this water molecule right here. This one right here. Okay, that's an H2O molecule. The red is the oxygen, the gray is the hydrogen. You can see there's two covalent bonds, right? This is a covalent bond and this is a covalent bond. But what else do you see? You see the hydrogen has a hydrogen bond here. This hydrogen has a hydrogen bond here. There's another hydrogen bond to a hydrogen from one lone pair and there's another hydrogen bond from another lone pair. So basically, all that hydrogen bonding is maximized, and when it does, it forms this crystal structure. And what do you have in here? That looks like a big hole. This looks like a big hole. And that looks like a big hole. So when you form ice, ice actually has these big pockets where air can fit inside of. Okay? There's actually air inside that, and that is why ice is less dense than water. It's because of the crystalline structure where hydrogen bonding is maximized. Okay? And we form this crystal lattice. If, you're to, if you melted ice to form water, well, you're not going to have all this hydrogen bonding maximized in this crystal lattice. And there's actually going to be water molecules in here, so it's going to be more dense. Anyhow, water is also an excellent solvent. We know ionic compounds, polar molecules, and that's because of its big old dipole moment, right? We know we've got a polar bond here, we've got a polar bond here. Add them all together, you get an overall vector like that. Even many small nonpolar molecules have solubility in water. That allows fish to breathe, right? They're able to extract oxygen from the water. Now, what kind of intermolecular forces would be responsible for a nonpolar molecule, small one, being dissolved in water, which is polar? It would be a dipole, dipole induced dipole, wouldn't it? Dipole induced dipole. And that's something that we talked about during the last lecture. Water has a really high specific heat capacity, doesn't it? 4.184 joules um, per mole Kelvin, or moles degrees Celsius. And that has the effect of moderating the temperature on coastal, um, uh, uh, on coastal cities or coastal climates. Why? Because over the summer, the water absorbs the heat. And then during the winter, it hangs on to that heat because water hangs on to its heat so well that that heat is going to dissipate slowly over the cooler months, and it serves to keep um, the city or the coastal climate warmer in the winter. And then over the winter, it gets colder and colder and colder, and it hangs on to that, to that uh, cold, so to speak. And so it releases its you know, coolness, or you get these offshore breezes in the summer. Anyhow, water expands when it freezes. That's tied in exactly here. At a pressure of one atmosphere, ice is less dense than liquid water. And this, again, is the crystalline structure of ice. I would encourage you, if you're really curious, you know, and I have lots of students who are curious, I think it's a good thing. Um, don't hesitate to Google the crystalline structure of water and look at, you know, a bunch of different pictures of it. And it will become abundantly clear how each one of those water molecules maximizes its hydrogen bonding and how you get those pockets, those holes in the crystal lattice. You know, where I did my undergraduate degree, which is at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia, there is a there was a professor there when I was, um, you know, a young guy whose job, his only job was to study water. He just studied water all day. You know, he just did nothing but water research. And I remember thinking, you know, when I was a freshman, I mean, what did I know? And I, I thought, man, how boring. You know, this is pretty lonely. 
like this is talking about water all day. It's like, what does he do? Just look at a glass of water and get paid for it, you know? <laughs> water has some really unique properties. So it says here the unique macroscopic behavior of water that emerges from its atomic and molecular properties. All right, what are the atomic properties of hydrogen and oxygen? The first one that comes to my mind is hydrogen has an electronegativity of 2.1 and oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5. Right? That means there's a delta En of 1.4. So the bond between hydrogen and oxygen is a polar bond, right? We represent that with a dipole like this. If you add those two dipoles together, okay, you get a resultant dipole or a net dipole that goes in this direction. So water is a polar molecule that's a molecular property and what else there's a huge difference in electronegativity between hydrogen and oxygen isn't there right and because of that huge difference in electronegativity we can also write delta positive here we could write delta negative here we could write delta positive here so if another water molecule is in the neighborhood right is in you know in proximity we can draw hydrogen bonds like this or like that okay now if we think of its solvent power what about ions in seawater like magnesium or sodium or chloride right since water has a delta negative side and a delta positive side it's going to be able to interact with both anions and cations and help to solubilize them because of its dipole induced dipole forces it can dissolve things like carbon dioxide and oxygen it's also going to be able to dissolve sugars, proteins, and cells because of its polarity. Um, what else? On account of its high heat capacity and um, delta H of vaporization, so it has a high heat capacity and a high um, enthalpy of vaporization, it's able to help our body to maintain homeostasis, right? If you think about it, the human body resists Temperature changes quite well. Now, one thing I've noticed about the human body is it never seems to be comfortable, at least mine isn't. You know, if you go up to a room full of people and you ask them, is anybody here too hot? You know, you'll always get a bunch of people raise their hands. And if you say, is anybody here too cold? You'll get a bunch of other people raising their hands. But, you know, so we take it for granted. But water, you know, since our bodies are mostly made of water, it helps to maintain our body temperature. It helps to narrow um, or limit the range of the temperatures here on the planet Earth. What else? Surface tension. Surface tension in capillarity. Well, if we think about surface tension, if we go back to that glass of water that I spoke about earlier today, okay, maybe I should just go back and copy it, but I said we have a glass of water. Okay, If you think about those molecules of water right at the surface, okay, right at the surface, maybe I need a different color, a little green, will that work? Yeah, if you have a water molecule right at the surface, Remember, it's only being pulled across and it's being pulled down. It's not being pulled up. What does that mean? It's going to keep those water molecules at the surface since they're only being pulled to the sides and being pulled down. It's like it provides like a little skin on top of the water's surface. Okay, and that's what surface tension is. Now, there's more information about that in our textbook. But um, in the interest of time, I'll let you maybe read a little bit more about what surface tension is. I kind of gave you a bit of a brief description there. I also want to talk about what capillarity is. If you take a really narrow tube and uh, a glass tube and you put it in water, you're going to see that water is actually going to go up into the glass tube. Okay. Now, if you're like, well, where, were the, where were the heck would I get a narrow glass tube? How, where am I supposed to see this, Mr. Dion? Well, let me give you another example of capillarity that I guarantee you that you know, 99% of you have seen, okay? If you have a graduated cylinder, say in the lab, you know, I'm sure that most of you took the lab um, this semester. If you have a graduated cylinder, you know, you have these gradations on it here, and you pour some water in it, what does it do? It forms a shape like that. It forms what's called a meniscus, right? You notice that the water on the sides is higher than the water in the middle. And there's a reason for that. The reason because is because the sides of the glass or the glass is made from silicon dioxide, which is polar. Okay. So if you have water molecules, right, they're going to be attracted to the sides of that container and they're actually going to pull and keep going up, 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 up that container until gravity is going to balance that out and start pushing them down. 
And so that's what capillarity is, okay? That's, you know, causes the meniscus to occur. What else? The open structure of ice. Um, it, can you imagine if ice was more dense than water, we'd be in a deal of a pickle, wouldn't we? Right? Because uh, lakes would freeze from the bottom. We wouldn't be able to play hockey. You know, I can't even imagine a world, world like that. It would be horrible. Um, anyhow, I'll just leave it as that. You know, these are the kind of things that we could sit here and ramble on for a long, uh, ramble on about for a long time, but I'll, I'll move on. Anyhow, I hope you get an idea that water is a pretty unique and interesting molecule. Now, if you think about this chapter, I mean, everything that we've talked about up until now, we've largely been talking about liquids. We spent a lot of time talking about liquids. Now we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about solids. And solids are actually a much you know, shorter section of this entire chapter, but there's four types of solids that you need to be aware of, molecular, network, covalent, ionic, and metallic. So let's go through what these are and we'll look at some pictures and some figures that'll help us you know, distinguish between these different types of solids. A molecular solid, the first one we're interested in, is obviously made up of molecules, right? Well, that makes sense, okay? What are the molecules held together by? They're held together by van der Waals forces. What are van der Waals forces? As I told you last lecture, van der Waals forces is a term we use to describe London forces and dipole-dipole forces, okay? Those forces. So, if we have a collection of molecules, molecules themselves are held together by covalent bonds, but I'm talking about a collection of molecules in a solid. Okay, now not only could they be held together by van der Waals forces, meaning London forces or dipole forces, they could also be held together by hydrogen bonding, right? Think about ice. What was it that held the water molecules together in ice or the H2O molecules together in ice? It was hydrogen bonding, okay? So the covalent bonds between molecules, that's an intramolecular force, right? Those are really strong compared to intermolecular forces, which are much weaker. So in a molecular solid, the strength or the, uh, the physical properties of a molecular solid are going to be based off of the strength of the intermolecular forces that hold the molecules together in that solid phase. Next, we have a network covalent solid. You guys know what a covalent bond is, right? We spent a lot of time talking about covalent bonds in this class. If you have a molecule that's basically just a molecule, if you have a solid that's basically, it's basically a gigantic molecule is why I said that. If you have a solid that's just made of, it's all put together by covalent bonds and nothing else, okay, that's a network covalent solid. There aren't a whole lot of examples. They're usually made of things like uh, carbon or silicon. Okay, the crystal in network covalent solid is really just one gigantic molecule. An example of a network covalent solid would be something like diamond. Okay, and we'll look at a picture of that. Ionic solids, we spent a lot of time talking about ionic compounds and we looked at the periodic table, you know, ionic equations, net ionic equations, um, a metal and a non-metal. Well, we know that an ionic solid is comprised of oppositely charged ions, an anion and a cation held together by electrical forces, right? There's an electrostatic attraction between positive and negative forces and that forms an ionic solid. We'll talk about those a little bit. And then a metallic solid, that means a metal, okay? Um, metals like silver, you know, gold, iron, chromium, you know, what holds metals together, right? Why are most metals solid? Not all, but why are most solid? Well, there, it says your structural unit is electrons and cations. Um, they have plus, that may have charges of plus one, plus two, plus three, so on and so forth. So we have cations, that are surrounded by electrons. It's basically what we have when we have a metal. Now, there's an old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. So if we wanna summarize all four of these in a picture, here we go. If we look at a molecular solid, remember a molecular solid is comprised of individual molecules. This is a molecule, this is a molecule, so on and so forth. So what are the forces that are holding those molecules together. Well, I don't know what molecule this is supposed to represent, but the two elements are the same, so it must be something like H2 or O2 or N2. Okay, so that would be a nonpolar molecule. What force would be attracting these molecules together, right? What's the force, what's the glue that's holding these together? 
Well, in this case, it would have to be a London force, okay? But again, any kind of molecular solid is going to be held together by hydrogen bonding, dipole dipole, or London forces. Okay, so the melting point, the boiling point, the physical characteristics, or the physical properties, rather, of the molecular solid are going to be based off of the strength of those intermolecular forces. A network covalent solid, as you can see, it's all held together by covalent. These are bonds, okay? These are IMFs, intermolecular forces. These are actually stinking bonds. So, I mean, that's, that's, those, that's strong. So that means the force that holds a network covalent solid together is really strong. It's an actual covalent bond. An ionic solid, we spent quite a bit of time talking about these. Yeah, um, but you can see that there's an electrostatic attraction between positive and negative, right? Our cations and, and anions. And if you go way back in this class, we talked about why metals are brittle. Or, sorry, why ionic, why ionic solids are brittle, right? And it's because we have these anions and cations and anyhow. And then when we have a metallic solid, a, met, a metal, I mean, we don't go into great detail about metals in chemistry 1401. I'll be totally frank with you, okay? But the way you can think about a metal in this class is you can kind of think about it as just being a nu nuclei, right? You see all these positive charges here? We have all these nuclei. And then basically we know that metals have low electronegativity. They have low electron affinity. So they want to give up electrons so bad that they'll even give it to a neighboring metal of the same type. So what am I saying? I'm saying that essentially the metals will kind of share all of their electrons. So we have all these electrons just flowing around here. Now, when we talked about electrolytes and non-electrolytes, if you remember what I said about an electrolyte, an electrolyte has electrons that move. Okay, so that is why metals, a lot of metals, are such good conductors of electricity because you can regard a metal as being a bunch of nuclei with a bunch of promiscuous electrons that are just moving all around, right? They're being shared between all of these. So since we have flow of electrons around all these metals, Sometimes we call it the, I'm not kidding, you're going to laugh at me, but sometimes we call this the electron C, the C of electrons. This is why metals are such good conductors of electricity. Okay, let's switch gears again and go right back to the beginning and talk about molecular solids. I only have one slide and it's this one here. If we have a molecular solid, right, we have a collection of molecules. Okay, so we have A and B, and then it's going to interact with A and B, right? We have all these different molecules. As I said, I'm repeating myself, and there's some kind of intermolecular forces holding those molecules together. In the solid phase, all those different points, when they're all organized, we call that a lattice, right? We spoke about crystal lattices. So the lattice points are going to be occupied by individual molecules, which are held together by IMFs, intermolecular forces, whether they be London forces, what we call um, an induced dipole, induced dipole, dipole, dipole forces, or hydrogen bonding. Because intermolecular forces are weaker than covalent bonds, they're weaker than the electrostatic interactions between cations and anions in ionic compounds, they're going to have lower melting points, and a lot of times they're going to be soft. They're also going to be poor conductors of heat and electricity. Why? Because there's no movement of anything in the molecule. Everything's held in a lattice point. Now, as we spoke about when we looked at these phase diagrams, we said that most of the time with molecular compounds like carbon dioxide, the solid is more dense than the liquid. And we actually see that with benzene. The molecular formula for benzene is C6H6. This is C6H6 liquid here, and this is C6H6 solid here. So you can see that benzene cubes, which I wouldn't recommend putting in your drink because benzene is carcinogenic, but you can see that solid benzene is actually more dense. It's not an anomaly. Whereas water, right? Water, oops, a different color, don't I? Water in the solid phase, what we call ice, is less dense than water in the liquid phase. So that's what a molecular solid is. And if you're like, you mean just like all the molecules we talk about in class? Yeah, yeah. If they're in the solid phase, that's a molecular solid. Okay, what about network covalent solids? Well, since a network covalent solid is held together by covalent bonds, okay, that's where it gets the name covalent from, 
they're going to have really high melting points, oftentimes above 1,000 degrees Celsius, because in order to convert this substance from a solid to a liquid, you have to break a bunch of covalent bonds, right? That's not going to be easy to do. They're also going to be insoluble in common solvents because you're not going to break a covalent bond with a solvent. What do you, you know, a solvent is going to interact by intermolecular forces. They're also going to be poor electrical conductors because there's no movement in a covalent solid. Everything's held together tight by covalent bonds. Some examples of covalent solids, though, would be graphite and diamond, which are allotropes. What's an allotrope? Just a different structural form of the same. Graphite and diamond are both carbon. Okay? They're nothing more than carbon. Like carbon, isn't that found in your charcoal? Yeah, it's also found in graphite, which is in your pencil. Okay? The pencil lead that we talked about, it's not lead, it's graphite that's in there. So um, if you look at the structure of diamond, diamonds is a three-dimensional structure that's where all the carbons are tetrahedral, whereas graphite is a two-dimensional structure where all the carbons are planar. Let me show you what I mean. Here are the allotropes of carbon. Right? So this is carbon, this is carbon diamond, and this is carbon graphite. Diamond is really expensive, isn't it? If anybody has diamond earrings or a diamond ring or a diamond necklace, you know that diamonds are expensive. What's the difference between the carbon and diamond and the carbon and graphite besides the price? Just the hybridization. If you look at this carbon atom right here, you can see it's surrounded by one, two, three, four carbons. All the bond angles are 109.5 degrees. What's the hybridization of that carbon? It's sp3. Whereas if you zoom in on one of these carbons here, you can see it's attached to one, two, three carbons like that. So the only difference between carbon and graphite is the hybridization of the carbon atom. Now, to break the covalent bonds in graphite, the covalent bonds that hold all those carbon bonds together, that's really difficult to do, okay? But since graphite is planar, you can see that every single one of these carbons here is planar. It actually forms sheets, right? That's a sheet. So these are like sheets, okay? Sheets of graphite. Because graphite can be used as a lubricant sometimes. I don't know if anybody here has ever used graphite as a lubricant. If you're trying to get a key, you know, maybe you have a rusty lock or something, you try to get a key in it. Sometimes you can use graphite as a lubricant, maybe in a car lock or something like that. Well, yes, the actual atoms of carbon in the sheet are held together by covalent bonds, which are exceedingly strong. But what's holding the sheets together? Nothing more than London forces, okay? Because there's no dipole here. Okay, so the sheets are held together by really weak forces, and that's why they can slide past one another. Okay, so that's why when you push graphite down onto a piece of paper, you know, the graphite breaks off. You're not breaking the covalent bonds here. You're just causing the sheets to slide past one another as the graphite goes on to your piece of paper.